Welcome to the Minor Consult, where I speak to the leaders shaping our world in diverse ways. Today, I'm joined by Katherine Coleman Flowers, an environmental activist and author who has brought national attention to unequal sewage and sanitation access for rural communities and people of color in the United States. Her advocacy on these issues has earned her a MacArthur Genius Grant and taken her to the White House and beyond, which only begins to describe Catherine's work and impact. I'm delighted to welcome her to the Minor Consult to discuss her journey to activism, the health and societal impacts of inadequate public sanitation, and her fight to give voice to marginalized communities most affected by this systemic lapse. Catherine, welcome. It's great to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. In speaking to many different leaders for this podcast, so many have drawn inspiration from their families, and I understand that you're no exception. Tell us about your parents, their activism in the civil rights movement, and how their passion for social justice influenced you growing up. Well, first of all, my parents were, I call them the jailhouse lawyers of our community because Everyone in the community, when they had a problem, they would go to them and they would somehow try to figure it out. And that was before the Internet, before everybody could go on the Internet and research everything. So I now look back and realize how smart my parents were. And people, and they also had the trust of the community. So just watching them and seeing the respect that they had of other activists in the community. I remember when my father died and the people that were a part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that came to his funeral, likewise with my mother. Uh, my mother, when she passed away, there were over 2,000 people that came to her funeral. And we were, that's when I really started to realize the impact that they had had on the community. And the work that I do now, the reason that I have the trust, I believe, of the community is not because I, I'm from the community, because my father you know, was raised there, but also because of the trust that they had built through the years. So their activism uh, has had a great influence on me. They also felt like, you know, you have to be able to give voice to the needs of the community. And they used the word community more than I use it now. That was the first time I ever heard the term community. I heard it from my parents. So I, I feel that every walk that I make, every I mean, every step that I make, I'm walking in their shadow. Because if it were not for the work that they did before me, it wouldn't be as easy, although it's hard, it wouldn't be as easy for me to do what I'm doing in a rural community like Lowndes County. I know that um, they must be very proud of you and and um, to see what you've accomplished now. I know that, uh, that I can't think of a better, more fitting uh, affirmation of their legacy than, than what you've done and what you are doing. As you just mentioned, you, you grew up in Lowndes County, Alabama, and Though your life journey took you away for several decades, you returned in 2000. You were working there as an economic development consultant when you discovered an injustice that has defined your activism for the past two decades. How did you first become aware of the county's lack of adequate sanitation? And what did you find out about the extent of the sanitation problem in Lowndes County and the reasons behind it? Well, first of all, you know, growing up in Lowndes County, I grew up on a septic system. And our septic system would fail to, first we had a cesspool. Uh, actually, if I take it back even further, when we first moved to Lowndes County, we didn't have indoor plumbing at all. So I know what it's like to use an outhouse. <laughs> and then from there, we got a cesspool and had indoor plumbing. And then from the cesspool at our next house, we had a septic tank. And sometimes it would fail and come back into the house. We just assumed it was a plumbing problem. We didn't know that was a greater problem. So in 2000, actually 2002, when I was working with a gentleman named Bob Woodson and his national neighborhood, uh, his, his group was called uh, the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, uh, we invited him to come to Lowndes County. And a county commissioner came to me and she said, I want you to go visit this family. We went to visit the family, and the, it was a husband and a wife that had been arrested because they had a failing septic tank. 
And that was when I first became aware of it. And when we, I remember going to their home and we could see the sewage actually running down the, the hill because their, their mobile home sat on top of a hill and there was a um, plot of land where several family members lived. And when we got out of the car, a minister came to Mr. Woodson. He was crying, saying that he had been told that he could no longer have service at his church because they didn't have a septic tank. And, of course, that was my first introduction to it and meeting that family because there was a family compound that was there. And, uh, and it was after that that we learned that this was a bigger problem because we started having town hall meetings around the county and people started coming forward. And, and sharing, you know, their struggles. And out of that, uh, we started doing a house-to-house -house survey. We went from house to house and found out that the problem was much, much larger and more complex than we had been told by the state officials. The state officials were saying, oh, people just can't afford a septic tank. But we found that it was more than that, that the septic systems were failing. And, and we did a study with uh, Baylor's National School of Tropical Medicine uh, Dr. Peter Hotez, where we actually found evidence of hookworm and other tropical parasites. And the people that had the highest amount of hookworm in their systems were not the people that were straight piping. It was the people that had failing septic systems where sewage were coming back into their homes as well. You, you just mentioned a few things about this, but, but what are some of the other dangers of living in these circumstances and having either a failed septic system or, or an inadequate septic system? Well, a lot of, one of the dangers is that a lot of people still complain about sewage coming back into their bathtubs or coming back into their sinks. I mean, who would, who would want to wash dishes in a sink where sewage is coming back into the sink or coming into their bathtub? Um, also, with children are in a lot of these communities, and you don't want children playing around raw sewage. And we also saw that during the height of the pandemic, Lowndes County had the highest per capita death rate from covid in the state of Alabama. And I, I have to believe that some of it was because people were vulnerable because they were living around raw sewage. And it wasn't long before your research showed that Lowndes County is not alone. Uh, you examined inequalities in access to sanitation and clean water across rural communities around the United States. Can you tell us what you uncovered and what you've so aptly called America's dirty secret? How extensive is the problem and who is affected most by the problem? This problem is in all 50 states and is very, very prominent in rural communities. And I've just been surprised at the people that have come to me and told me that this exists in places where I didn't think it existed. It's just that they have not been prosecuted. I think the reason that the Alabama problem came to the forefront was because people were being prosecuted. We found in places like um, when we went to, to the Central Valley, there in California, there are places in California that have, uh, where people don't have adequate sanitation or they don't have working sanitation for, obvious, for many reasons. And we would find that in places where it rains a lot, uh, there's been a lot of storms in California recently. I'm sure that a lot of those communities that are on septic tanks have been experiencing failures which included either coming out on the ground or coming back into their homes. But what was even more startling was not just in rural communities. I just came back from Miami, and the Miami-Dade County area has an over-billion-dollar septic tank problem. And they are moving to convert people from septic tank to sewage because of the issues that they're having. They're going into the other part of, of having uh, failing sanitation is that it goes, into, uh, it goes into the water. It can cause algae blooms, fish kills, et cetera. It contaminates water tables. And we're also finding that where there's sea level rise, which was the issue in Miami, but in a lot of places, like even in Lowndes County, the water tables are very high. And that makes these septic systems more likely to fail. So we're finding that it's more prevalent in rural communities. But we're also finding that in some urban areas where they've used septic tanks, that they're having the same kind of failures. And that was one of the big surprises that we found. But it's not, it's not just in one area. It's not just in places that, are, that have, um, for example, like Hawaii has a lot of problems. Puerto Rico has problems. But we're finding in all 50 states, the, the other states as well, are having the same issues, whether they're mainland or, or in, on islands. 
what are some of the causes of a septic system failing? Um, and then how do you go about combating those uh those causes of the failure. You mentioned one, which is to install uh, sewage systems that that collect uh, sewage from a variety of different homes and then lead to a central processing plant. But but why do septic systems fail? Well, we think that based on our research, we, we're finding that septic systems tend to, everybody's telling us the same thing. When there's lots of water from coming from the sky, which we cannot control, they tend to fail. Uh, when they get full of water, uh, or the ground is saturated with water, uh, that tends to, to lead to failure. That means that the gravity start pushing it back into the house or it, push it pushes it out onto the ground. Uh, we've also found that uh, one, one university that we're working with, they have found that uh, there's one home that they're actually monitoring. And in that home, you know, the way they calculate based on the number of bedrooms in the house how much water you're supposed to use. Well, this particular family, only two people are living there, uh, and 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 less than, and they're using less than the allotted amount of water. But they can see the failures. They can see the failures when it rains. That not only does the septic tank fail, but the field lines are failing. So we feel that because septic tanks have been designed for another era that that's one of the reasons why they're failing. We were told by one engineer that a lot of the septic systems are made from the most degraded form of cement. So we mm -hmm. think that there should be a move on the way or a challenge to redesign how septic systems are, are made because currently the way they are, they are not working. And a lot of people that are in a position to pay uh, to convert, like the people in the Miami-Dade County area, they're moving away from septic systems to these more centralized systems. But for those that are in areas that may not be able to get on centralized systems, we need to come up with a better way to treat wastewater. And 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 make sure, and I think we have the means to do it. I, I often say that I know that uh, here where I'm located in the Huntsville area where the Marshall Space Flight Center is, they are able to take wastewater, urine, and turn it into drinking water. Just imagine if we were to take some of that technology and come up with a new way to treat wastewater. We would be a lot better off. And with climate change, it's more imperative than ever than we address these issues and, and, and use innovation to come up with some real uh, resilient solutions. One effect of climate change is, of course, uh, a change in the distribution of rainfall. And, and you were describing what we've experienced here in California over the past couple of months. What other manifestations of climate change are contributing to this problem with, with septic systems? We're, well, we live in areas where they have high water tables, and the water tables are getting higher. You know, mm -hmm. with, with, these, with these ice caps melting, people just assuming that, that the water is only impacting the areas like in the Arctic, <laughs> but it's not. Sea level rise is impacting all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been in places in Lyons County where we've gone down six inches and struck water. The other interesting thing that we found in terms of the natural geological makeup of the area is that a lot of the water is salty. That you have to go down at least a thousand feet to get to drinking water, fresh water. Mm -hmm. So to put a septic system, that's a factor they don't even account for when they're designing these systems. So we're just finding out that whether it's, um, whether it's places like the Hamptons, <laughs> in some parts of the Hamptons are rural. They're having, they're having wastewater failures too. Whether it's places like on the beach in Florida where people go in what we call the Emerald Coast, here in Alabama and Florida, people are having failures there as well. So in Alaska, they're having failures because of melting permafrost. So there are different reasons why they're failing. Different, um, there are different factors around the country. I've even talked to people as far away as Nigeria. I talked to one young man who was a law student at Columbia. He was working on an advanced degree in law, and he said he was clerking for a judge in Lagos and had to move out of his apartment because the sewage came back into his apartment. These are global issues. This is not just a U.S. issue, but it's a problem that we have to solve because one of the things that we've learned from COVID, we already know that there are diseases out there 
that can come from poor sanitation. Some of the worst epidemics in the world have come from, you know, like cholera. Uh, they're, they're, some of the worst epid epidemics in the world have come from the lack of the improper treatment of sewage. And even when the Rockefeller Sanitation Commission came up with the whole idea of public um, sanitation, they were looking at hookworm, something that we thought that didn't even exist. And I think it's a shame that in the richest country in the world, we're still dealing with these issues, then clearly, if it's a problem here, we know that it's a problem in areas that don't have as much wealth. And out of that could come diseases uh, that we are not prepared to deal with. Absolutely. What type of scientific and technological innovations are you seeing uh, that may offer some promise in addressing some of the issues associated with the rising water table and uh, the way septic tanks and their fields are planned. Are, are you excited about the science that's going on and what, what more needs to be done? I'm excited about the fact that we're talking about it, but we have not seen the science and we haven't seen testing that showed that it would work in places like Lowndes County. We have not seen that. But what we are excited about is that people are now paying attention. You know, when I first started talking about this, they said that this was not a U.S. problem. Actually, in 2002, I remember making a speech about it, and I tried to find organizations that even fund sanitation in the United States, and there were none. So now people do acknowledge that this is a problem. It's no longer America's dirty secret. You know, it's not even, a, it's still dirty, but it's not a secret anymore. So I think that the fact that uh, we have had outreach from people from the Gates Foundation and others, universities. Young people are very inspired about finding solutions to this. So I feel like really within the next five years, we're going to see more technology and innovation that's driven by climate change uh, that will allow us to find solutions. We're also seeing that with the bipartisan infrastructure bill, for an example, there's funding available now for research and development as well as in those areas where they may have systems technology that works, that they can get access to it. What we have to work on now is making sure that these communities that are in need uh, have the brain trust in place to write to get the grants that are needed to be able to, to, to uh, replace or put in place the, the infrastructure that might be available. I'm also optimistic because recently, uh, actually it was, it, was, it was August of last year, the, uh, the White House, uh, got involved along with the uh, uh, the president sent his infrastructure czar, uh, the USDA secretary and the EPA administrator to Lowndes County to announce the closing the wastewater access gap. That's the first time they've ever done that in 11 counties across the United States. Uh, counties like in New Mexico, for an example, in Arizona and indigenous communities that have always had wastewater issues to uh, West Virginia, North Carolina, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, those are places that are part of this closing the wastewater access gap. And it's the first time that it has been acknowledged on a federal level that this is a national problem. So I'm very optimistic with all of these developments that is going to lead to the type of innovation that's necessary to finally solve this problem. That's wonderful. Uh, learning your story, I'm struck by how you stepped up to take on an extremely daunting problem with no clear path to the resolution of the problem. What drove you to take the lead on such a difficult fight, and what's kept you motivated in moments of discouragement? Well, I took the lead because I felt like if I didn't take the lead, then my grandson was going to have to keep fighting that same fight. You know, when I when I left uh, Lowndes County and went to other places and came back and saw that a lot of things had not changed, I, I guess it was the spirit of my parents <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that propelled me to do something. And I, 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 I'm, I'm my parents' child. But in addition to that, I just think that, you know, my faith also directs me to do something, that I can't pretend like it's not existing and look the other way and not hold people accountable for that. Because initially, the people that were victimized were the people that were being, you know, that was the official, the official uh, uh, position was, it was their fault. But we had to do the research necessary to back it up, to figure out 
how do we solve this problem? And I think that a lot of the inspiration I get is from Lowndes County's history. You know, mm -hmm. Lowndes County at one point, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois actually came to Lowndes County in the early part of the, uh, of the 1900s and did a labor study because Lowndes County had uh, one of the worst labor situ situations at the end of slavery. Uh, and he was able to actually, it, his, his study, his survey was so explosive that they would not publish it, but it had an impact on how he moved forward from that point on. Then of course, uh, there was a sharecroppers union that was organized in Lowndes County. I mean, just to think about how bold that was to organize a sharecroppers union during a time when violence was very, very prevalent. That's why Lowndes County earned the name Bloody Lowndes. Most of the Selma to Montgomery March goes through Lowndes County. There's even a recent documentary that's airing on Peacock called Lowndes County and the Road to Black Power. Lowndes County in 1966 tested the Voting Rights Act by running its own slate of candidates with the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which became, because of its emblem, the Black Panther was actually the, the so-called original Black Panther Party, and that was before uh, it was founded in Oakland, but it was a political party. So I think with that history and that being a part of who I am, that is part of what has inspired me and what uh, and, and forced me to use what I've been exposed to to find solutions and to find partnerships. People like the folk at Baylor, people at Columbia, I mean, people at Stanford even, that have been a part of, of helping us find solutions to this and, and highlighting this problem. And, and going forward, I think that where I get inspiration, it's like looking at climate change. This is all connected to climate change. And I know that people are going to have to move. They don't want to. But because of climate change, they're going to have to move. And I know that part of moving would mean that they're going to have to find ways to treat sanitation. And this may be one of the ways that can facilitate when people move away from these coastal areas, and these flood-prone areas, and they have to move to these rural communities, that hopefully out of this we will find a way to uh, preserve humankind and also make a positive contribution to building the kind of resilience and sustainability that we're going to need to have a livable planet for generations to come. In your activism, you've traveled from the local stage of Lowndes County to the national stage, and you've been named to the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, and you've received the MacArthur Genius Grant. How were you able to attract such meaningful attention to a problem that affects our most vulnerable people and people who oftentimes don't have a voice uh, communicating their problems? That's a good question. How was I able to do that? I think that I have just been fortunate that people have come to support me that, uh, and support our cause. Uh, people like Brian Stevenson, for an example, the Equal Justice Initiative. Brian wrote the foreword for my book, and he actually grew up with a failing septic system. But he paid attention when he saw me in the news and gave me the lifeline that I needed to be able to exist until we got to this point. Because I had to fight people that were naysayers and people with the state that were saying that this was not a problem. So it was, uh, it was, it, I think it was, um, some of it was, serendipitous, and some of it was just di divine. <laughs> you know, if I, if, I could really, uh, if I could really figure out why people paid attention and came, because it took years. It didn't happen overnight. You know, I actually did this work for a very, very long time before people started paying attention. But I think the fact that I was consistent and, and it was always, it may have started off with a few people, but as time went on, the momentum started to grow. A lot of those young people that I talked to at Duke and other places ended up becoming people that were uh, policy makers and, and people that had influence and introduced me to other organizations. And out of that came this. And, and one of the, just an example of the many things that happened, you know, we invited the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty to come to Lowndes County. Uh, when Dr. Austin came to Lowndes County, it was the same year that the news came out about the hookworm study, which was in fact a peer reviewed study. So when he presented his report to the UN, um, 
uh, General Assembly in the Human Rights Council that is in Geneva, I happened to be there. Here we were on the global stage talking about Lowndes County and septic tanks, although he was talking about poverty, but because of his visit there, he got a chance to see uh, how it was all connected. And consequently, uh, we got even more support uh, because of those kinds of things. So I think that part of one of the things that I learned growing up you know, with being my parents' child is to reach out and try to talk to people that you normally wouldn't talk to. And some of our support have been people that may have been of various political persuasions, but they believe that we all have a right to sanitation. Well, that's, that's so meaningful. And you've been extraordinarily successful at raising awareness about this important issue. What's your advice for people who are passionate about a cause and who want to bring about meaningful change, but maybe don't know where to start? Well, I think start small, you know, start where you are and, and try to find allies. And what I had to do is that I took the time to learn. I talked to the people who were living with the problem. They're the ones that, I wouldn't have a MacArthur Genius Award if it were not for the Miss Charlie Mays in, in the community, who, or, or, or the Pamela Rushes, and other people that shared their stories with me and were able to share their stories to other people that came into the community so they could see. That's how Bernie Sanders was able to see because when Dr. Austin came, he went back and told what he saw. But had people not opened their doors for him to see it, he wouldn't have been able to share it with anyone. So I think the first thing to do is find people of like mind that you can work with. And then the second thing is try to, try to get as much knowledge as you can about what the issues are. And look at the policies, too, because sometimes the policies are part of the reason that we have the problem. And we may have there are different ways in which to work on solutions. But having, I, I think for me, having a, um, a cohort of people, I've had a cohort of people from everybody like Al Gore and the Climate Reality Project's daughter, Corinna Gore, who actually introduced me to her father uh, in California, Tom Steyer and Kat Taylor, you know, Jane Funda. There are a lot of people, and so many more people that folk don't know. And by talking about this and writing about it, I would suggest that if you have knowledge about it, try to write an op-ed and see how many more people are out there that are dealing with the same problem and that you can coalesce with to work on solutions. Catherine, I wanna end with two questions that I ask all my guests. First, what do you think are the most important qualities for a leader today? The most important quality for a leader today is to listen to the people. Because oftentimes we feel that we know all the answers. And we assume that if they don't have the degrees, they don't know. But if it were not for those people that are sitting and living in those communities every day in Lowndes County, talking to me and me listening to them, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I think that's the most important part. Know when to step back and listen and let them give you direction on how to move and get things done. Because I think because I was in a position to push and make those connections and meet people, but I would always take people to them. Because when I get there, I be quiet. I let them talk because they're the experts. And I think recognizing who the real experts are is, is also another good quality of a leader. And my second question is, what gives you hope for the future? When I talk to my seven-year-old grandson, I ask him, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, a scientist or an astronaut. That gives me hope for the future. That's wonderful. Well, Catherine, so much, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you for listening to the Minor Consult with me, Stanford School of Medicine, Dean Lloyd Minor. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion with environmental health advocate, Catherine Coleman Flowers. Please send your questions by email to the Minor Consult at theminorconsult.com and check out our website, theminorconsult.com, for updates, episodes, and more. To get the latest episodes of The Minor Consult, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the podcast five stars. Your feedback 
helps make this podcast happen. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to our next episode. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and be kind. Be kind.